In the early 90s, I made that leap from my beloved 8-bit to the 16. It was the start of a whole new look and sound. This is the story of my 16-bit days. And welcome to this first episode. And in this one, I'm going to have a look at a particular Mega Drive slash Genesis game that I absolutely loved from the early 90s. Rocket Knight Adventures burst onto the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive in 1993, courtesy of Konami. If you know your 16-bit or arcade history, the late 80s to mid 90s was Konami's golden period, as far as arcade and console gaming goes. It's almost like they could do no wrong. Tiny Toon Adventures, The Simpsons Arcade, any of the Turtles games, Sunset Riders, etc, etc. Konami were an unstoppable force in 8, 16 and arcade scenes, and Rocket Knight hit right in the middle of all this golden gaming chaos. This game was a total blind bar for me in 1993. I had seen a small preview in a gaming magazine, but knew very little about the game. But that Konami logo gave me enough confidence to pick it up from a dodgy gaming shop I used to frequent in Durban, South Africa, in an alley called London House Arcade, which ironically had no arcades, but just a bunch of gaming shops run by questionable individuals selling bootleg console games for prices normal people could actually afford. I bought a lot of games there. Rocket Knight was a platform action game, although platforming is just a small part of the gameplay and the fast paced action nature was where the game really shines. It was directed by Nobuya Nakazato, who'd also worked on the PS1 classic Vandal Hearts, which I absolutely love, and Contra 3 Alien Wars, amongst a host of other absolute gems. Unlike many Genesis games up to that point, which were variations on Super NES versions, Rocket Knight was the first time Konami made a Sega exclusive from the ground up and wow was it impressive. Every single programming trick was thrown at Sega's system to push it to the limit in not only visual terms but with the FM sound chip getting one of the best soundtracks of the Genesis 16-bit era. So much so that I actually bought the vinyl soundtrack many years later. Rocket Knight was really something special and part of a trilogy of exclusive Genesis classics that our Sega owners really got to revel in. So before we go any further let's check out a 16-bit selection from one of my social media friends. Hello, my name is Todd the Top Loader and today what am I going to be talking about? Shinobi 3, the ninja master himself. You had the revenge of Shinobi, Shadow Dancer, if you want to include that. Some people do, some people don't. I personally don't care because <laughs> I'm talking about Shinobi 3. What a great game and I never knew it existed until the Wii Virtual Console. What? Well look, I had a Super Nintendo growing up and I had a Master System back in the day as well, but I never had a Mega Drive itself. So I missed a lot of his great games. Sure, I had Sonic to play with friends, but not many of them had the Shinobi games. When it came onto the Wii Virtual Console around 2006 or 5 or whatever it was at the time, I played it because I had heard the name Shinobi, and I was curious to play the game Shinobi. When I played the third one for the first time, it blew my mind. I couldn't believe how great a game it was and what I was missing out on. I thought it was fantastic because I love ninjas. If you know me, you know I love ninjas. I love the Ninja Turtles. I love the last ninja game on the Commodore 64. I love ninjas. Everything about ninjas I love. So this is a perfect game for me to play. And if I was a kid playing this, I would have loved it so much. But I never had a Mega Drive. I never had a Mega Drive. Now, I have all the Shinobi games on the Mega Drive, sitting there nicely on my shelf, looking beautiful and bright. Yeah, I love them. I love the box arts. I love everything about these releases. You could run and jump and spray out all your shurikens to the enemies around you. Like a big bomb fire of shurikens coming down at them, exploding onto them. What a fun game. It had stealth, it had climbing, it had everything you want to do in a ninja game. It had superpowers that would explode onto the screen. It was exciting. Look how excited I am just talking about how exciting Shinobi 3 is being a ninja master in himself. 
What I love also about this game is how you get the horse riding levels. It changes it up. It reminds me of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when you go onto like the surfboards and stuff like that and there's still a, still a surfing but with horses on back. You're on a horse's back. You're doing all different types of things in this game compared to the previous games because it changes it up that much to make it a little bit more varied in the overall scheme of things. That's Shinobi 3. It's the pinnacle of the series for me. Yes, people do prefer The Revenge of Shinobi. No questions there because it's also a great game. They're both great games. For me, it's Shinobi 3 though. It's literally my favourite game to play on the Mega Drive. Once I found it, I couldn't believe it was there the whole time, but I've been missing out for so long. Everything, all these elements, mystical elements come together. And you feel like you are a ninja, stealth moding throughout the levels. And that's what you want. You want to feel like a ninja. And that's what this game does. It makes you feel like you are a ninja. And that's all I've ever wanted to be, was a ninja. If you know me at all, growing up, all you know that of me is that I've always just wanted to be a ninja. And this makes me feel like a ninja. And that's why I bloody love this game. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. So after that cool selection, let's get back to the featured game. And now onto the actual game itself, which from the moment you slap it in till the time you turn it off, just puts a big smile on your face. In Rockin' you play Sparkster, a possum trying to stop an invasion of a pig army on the land of Elhorn. Equipped with a trusty sword and a jetpack, he sets out to get things sorted. The game is made up of seven stages in total with multiple parts to each. Gameplay switches are around every corner of this game, from the rock'em sock'em robot bashing, shoot 'em up sequences platform action and of course our minecart section because what's a 90s game without a minecart section the bosses are the real highlight showcasing extreme originality in design and gameplay but also a visual treat like something out of some sort of demented treasure game <laughs> rocket Knight's simple jump slice and boost mechanic make every gameplay switch feel unique to play and they all highlight a different part of the gameplay to enjoy the difficulty is also well balanced going from a walk in the park to challenge Challenging without being too annoying, graphically it truly is a feast for the eyes. Multiple parallax scrolling effects, wonderfully animated sprites and it's extremely colourful to say the least. The music never misses a beat and features a who's who of Konami soundtrack kings and queens delivering a score that perfectly captures each level it's designed for and puts to rest the bad Genesis FM sound theory as it really comes down to actual programming skills at the end of the day like with everything else. It's so sublime and worth buying the soundtrack for without a second thought. Rocket Knight is the full 16-bit package, visually stunning with brilliant level and boss designs. If you've never played it, then please add it to your backlog. You will not be disappointed. And thanks for joining me, Bastish B at 64K. I hope you had a good time. Also, please check out the links to my guests in the video description. And if you can please like and subscribe, that'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers. And welcome to the second episode of 16-Bit Days. I'm your host, Bassish B, and today we're going to have a look at a particular Super Nintendo game from the early 90s with one of my favorite characters of all time. Indiana Jones' Greatest Adventures was released in 1994 and was another co-production between Factor 5 and LucasArts. LucasArts had previously put out Super Star Wars and Super Empire Strikes Back both on the Super Nintendo. This title however was one game encompassing the entire Indiana Jones trilogy of movies including Raiders of the Lost Ark, 
the Temple of Doom and the Last Crusade. As a kid of the 80s, this and the Back to the Future trilogy were my jam. I watched them both countlessly, so when I heard they were making this, I was extremely excited. Unfortunately, I didn't have a Super Nintendo. So I had to wait until the late 90s before finally getting to play this for the first time. But it definitely lived up to my expectations. The game was worked on by Factor 5, who are a bunch of European programmers and musicians, all ex-employees of German software house Rainbow Arts. And the combination of Julian Engelbrecht, Andreas Escher, Ramiro Vaca, and Thomas Engel were all involved with the making of this platform gaming gem. These guys worked on some of Europe's best shooters, from the Run and Gun Classics Turrican 1 and 2, and shoot 'em up specials Catechus and X out. This was just some of the games they helped bring to the masses, and they definitely brought the A game to this project. And you can clearly tell they love the subject matter, because a crazy amount of detail is jammed into this game's massive 28 levels of action. It was released at the exact same time they put out the last part of the Super Star Wars trilogy, namely Super Return of the Jedi. Damn, those Super Nintendo boys were really spoiled for choice with this double dose of 16-bit goodness. And let's stop here for a second, take a little break. We'll go over to my friend Todd the Top Loader for one of his favorite Super Nintendo selections. Hello, my name is Todd the Top Loader and today I'm going to be talking about Super Star Wars! I love this game. Can you tell? I mean, I've got enough copies of it. Why do I have so many copies of this game? Because that's how much I love it. The more, the better for me to have, to look at. I just love buying this game. I don't know why. It's a sickness. Help me, please. Somebody out there, please help me. Yeah. Super Star Wars. Is it a hard game? Mm, to some people it is. And to me, it was a hard game to play. But now, I find it very easy. Because why? Because I gave it a chance. I gave it a really good chance. I worked out the mechanics of the game. And what I found when I dug deep, when I finally got to actually beat the game, when I was 11 years old, when I got it for Christmas 1993, one of the best experiences of my life, without even seeing the movie before, which actually got me into the movies, that's how much of an impact this one little game made on me. All you have to know is how to beat the game to beat the game. It sounds kind of silly to say that, I know, I understand that, especially when it comes to levels like the Sandcrawler. Everybody seems to talk about the Sandcrawler, and I tell you what, when I first played the Sandcrawler, I thought the exact same thing as every single body person that played that game. It's damn hard. The jumping mechanics in this game is key. If you don't know how to jump properly, then you won't be able to get past the Sandcrawler, because that's all about the platforming and the jumping. You have to work out that Everything depends on whether you can get to the best guns in the game. Now, you've got to bring the balance of the power, the force, to go right in the middle. Gun number three out of five, the homing missile, will help you immensely. If you can find the secret locations of the power-ups to the homing missile, you will get accuracy out of this thing because it directly goes to the enemies on screen, which will help you in levels that are normally harder, like the sand crawler or any other levels where the stormtroopers are jumping at you if you have the homing missile in your hand you will realize that this game becomes much easier this game itself actually brought me into star wars as a franchise i never seen the movie before when i played this game i had never seen the movie i bought this game because my brother he wanted the game and we shared our Super Nintendo together so we had to share the games that we bought as well. Even if I paid for half of it, we had to share the game. So we had to go between us, we had to find a balance of ourselves to get the games that suited each of us. I wasn't a Star Wars guy, I actually didn't think I would even like the game, but I ended up liking it more than he did. It actually got me into the movies. I had never seen the movies before I played the game. I played the game not knowing the story, even though the story is a little bit janky anyway in the game. It's not completely canon, of course, because it's a game. But it actually took me into the Star Wars franchise completely to this day where I'm a big Star Wars fan. The music itself really got me hooked. And that was the first time I ever heard the Star Wars music. Well, aside from movies that parodied the movie, for the most part, most of the music I heard from the game. When I saw the movie, it all rung the bells in my ears because I realized, wow, this is a great soundtrack, and they really did such a great job with the soundtrack putting it into the game. Each level that you play through, it has a way of beating the game level. Because 
it's not their straightforward even though it's a running gun game there are ways to beat it maybe hidden away in the background literally with the secret blaster upgrades if you can get the secret blaster upgrades it makes the game much easier super star wars is certainly one of the best games that i love to play frequently i still play it now years and years years later 1993 was when i first played it and 2022 is a long time since 1993. do the math you can see the gap in the middle on how big that is and i'm still playing it I wouldn't be playing a game that's so bad, right? If it was a bad game, would I be still playing it? No, I wouldn't be. I'm here talking about it and how great it is and asking for you to please give it a go. So it's for now, I'll let you go. It's been fun. This is me, the Top Loader, signing off. For now. And thanks again to Todd for another great suggestion. You can check out his channel, The Top Loader, in the video description. Now back to the featured game. The game itself kicks off in Raiders of the Lost Ark. You don't get to choose the movie, instead play through all of them as if it's one big story. Passwords are gained after each of the 28 levels completion, making it easy to return to whatever level you want later. Gameplay for the most part is of the multi-directional platformer variety, pretty much a standard for any mid-90s release. During the levels you can get to pick up gold for points, extra lives and lots of hidden areas to discover. You can use your fists and rolls to take out enemies picking up a whip for defense and swinging across these large gaps. Guns for quick kills and grenades which act as screen killing devices taking out everything on screen with one shot. Almost every single action scene from all three movies are painstakingly recreated here and expanded upon. Variations on these levels also pop up from needing to rescue the kids in the Temple of Doom to various run for your love sequences or boss encounters to help vary out the gameplay. There's also a series of impressive Mode 7 levels mixed in as well, taking some of the big set pieces such as Indy and Henry's escape from the Zeppelin in the Last Crusade. Why, yes. when, no. The inflatable raft mountain sequence from the Temple of Doom, as well as the minecart scene of course. The story follows each movie very closely with digital stills fleshing out the story with quotes from the movies. The music is absolutely fantastic with brilliant chiptune renditions of the best of John Williams epic scores. All the main themes from all the movies are here, with my favourite being the epic sacrifice chant track from the Temple of Doom. Like with Super Star Wars that Todd looked at earlier, the music really boosts the enjoyment of these games immensely. As soon as that indie theme kicks in, you can't help but want to go on an adventure. Graphics overall are excellent, detailed and extremely varied with some digitized voices and some music satisfying sound effects. My only criticism with this game is the slot imbalance in the difficulty. We are going to die. It can go from a walk in the park in one level to extreme difficulty in the next. So just be prepared to be slapped in the face a lot. This could have easily been another lazy licensed product, but Factor 5 delivered yet again for LucasArts and made an exceptional indie game that ranks right up there with the best of LucasArts own point and click adventure games as one of the best Indiana Jones games out there. And thanks for joining me, Bastish B and Todd the Top Loader for another episode of 16 Bit Days. If you can please like and subscribe they'll be greatly appreciated and we'll both see you next time. Cheers. And welcome to another episode of 16 Bit Days. In this episode, I'm going to have a look at two pretty cool Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive shoot 'em ups. So let's not waste any more time and get straight to the action. Air Buster, or Aero Blasters as it's also known, burst onto the arcade scene in 1990 by Kaneko. A Japanese arcade developer founded in 1980 who had many of their early games published through Taito. But by 1990 and with the release of Airbuster, they were publishing their own games made under the Kaneko label. They were a pretty obscure company outside of Japan with notable games you may have played being Airbuster, DJ Boy and my not so guilty pleasure game the Kung Fu Master Jackie Chan until finally officially filing for bankruptcy in 2004. Their back catalogue is filled with strange forgotten games so if you're looking for something new in the retro realm to play 
then check them out. Airbuster was another game in a long line of horizontal shooters, hitting the arcades at the time. It didn't offer anything new to the genre, but what it did, it did really well. In 1991, the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive versions were released, and were extremely faithful renditions of the arcade, with the graphics being particularly close to their arcade counterpart. During my original Mega Drive days, I never came across many shoot 'em ups in shops. It's quite bizarre actually, <laughs> maybe living in South Africa made them obscure to come across. But after moving to Canada in the late 90s, I remember finding this game in a bargain bin, with many other awesome 16-bit classics discarded due to everyone's infatuation with the new 3D technology. So naturally I bought it and didn't regret the purchase one little bit. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Let's stop here for a few minutes and we're going to go over to podcaster extraordinaire Daz and he's going to give us one of his favorite underappreciated Mega Drive slash Genesis shoot 'em ups. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Daz. This is one of my picks, the Steel Empire or the Empire of Steel, which is known in the PAL territories. Um, it's not really a, a game that's really well known. I love this game. I discovered this on the on the DS actually. It was a it was a downloadable game on the DS, and I thought this is really cool. It also came on the GBA as far as I know. But um, yeah, then when I found out that it was from a Mega Drive game, I went, this is awesome. So I went and sorted this out. And if you love your shmups, this is really really cool. This is one of the one of the best shmups I've played, especially on the Mega Drive. You can pick two different aircrafts. You've got like an air balloon. And um, oh, there you go. And you've got a, a plane right there. So, and they've, the the air balloons uh, has a higher armor, like it's a stronger armor. The plane has weaker armor, but it's faster. So, obviously, the balloon is a lot slower. They've got different um, bullets, that kind of thing. But you got like boss levels. It's very hectic. It's a very very hectic game. But it is so freaking cool. I love it so much. Highly recommend it. Like I said, if you love your schmups, I would go for it, The Steel Empire. And after that cool suggestion, let's get back to our featured game. And now back to Airbuster, the Genesis conversion, giving us six extremely varied horizontal levels. You control one of the blaster ships if played solo, with the game supporting an excellent two-player mode as well. You attempt to defend Earth from a full-on mechanized alien attack on Earth. As per usual, Earth only sends one ship to defeat an army, which seems pretty logical to me. You can pick up a whole range of weapons, seven in total, with homing missiles and a cool spread shot being particularly useful. It's also one of those shooters where you will need to pay attention to the pickups because some weapons are much more useful than others in certain levels so be warned. You can also collect items that boost your overall firepower making each weapon essentially upgradable. This game is mid difficulty with only the fast paced escape stage and several bosses being the real challenges but once you get their patterns down it's not too hard. Two player mode obviously makes this way easier. I really love the music. It's fast solid rocking beats. Each one tailored to the diverse looking set of levels that are all completely different from one another. And the graphics are really impressive for such an early Mega Drive title, with nice parallax action and impressive boss encounters. So if you missed this early 90s Mega Drive slash Genesis release, now's the time to strap on in and give those aliens a bit of photon blasting hell. And thanks for joining me, Bastish B and Daz for today's games. If you can please like and subscribe, they'll be greatly appreciated. I'll see you next time. Cheers. Hey, I'm Bastish B and welcome to another episode of 16-Bit Days. In this episode, we're going to be having a look at two different action platform adventure games from the 90s. And I'll also be joined by a guest, Todd the Top Loader, 
Australia's most crazy retro gamer and he'll be giving one of his choices as well. But for now, let's go to my first pick. The King of Demons was released in 1995 on Super Famicom, exclusively in Japan by KSS. It was a dark, foreboding action platform adventure game, often described as Castlevania with a gun. It was unlike most cutesy offerings on the Nintendo system, but its demon-infused gothic overtones were probably the reason it never got released in the West, which is such a shame. KSS or Kawakura Superstation were a Japanese company and were founded in 1988. They primarily released anime and were responsible for publishing titles such as Battle Angel Elita and The Legend of Arslan OVAs, and also provided services to other companies to translate and subtitle anime for international releases. The irony is they never translated The King of Demons. In the mid 90s though they dipped their toes into video game publishing and for roughly a 5 year run they put out almost 30 titles across multiple platforms such as the PC-98, Sega Saturn and PS1. 99% of these games though never left Japan. The King of Demons puts you in the shoes of Abel, a dude that has to travel through the seven layers of hell to rescue his wife Maria and his daughter Iria. Your dodgy friend sacrificed them to Lucifer for his resurrection. You know, that old chestnut. Your wife unfortunately didn't survive, but she now joins you as a fairy assistant as you fight your way down the seven levels to rescue Iria, who's apparently still alive. And so the run and gun platform style adventure starts with massive boss fights, plenty of story cutscenes, and an overall fantastic visual and audio production set this whole game in motion. Okay, so we're gonna stop this video yeah, just for a few minutes, so we're gonna go over to Todd and he's gonna talk about one of his personal favorite action platform adventure games. Hello, my name is Todd, the top loader, and today I'm here to talk about Super Castlevania 4. A game that almost eluded me. I had a Super Nintendo and I had many opportunities to buy it. Back in the 1990s, when I had my Super Nintendo, my brother begged me in the shop to get this game. I love this game, I've played it before. But me, looking at the cover, as awesome as it actually looks, as you can see from my own personal copies, I said no, I don't like this medieval type stuff. Was I wrong? Was I right? Let's just face it right now. I was wrong. I've got it here on camera recording through the microphone and the video lens. I was wrong about this game. I didn't play it until 2006 when the Wii Virtual Console came up and it was one of the first ones to get released. There was nothing else really to buy. So I thought to myself on a whim, well you know what, let's just give us a try. And I'm so glad I did because what a great game it was. And I thought to myself, why didn't I buy it back in the day because now to buy a physical copy of it is damn expensive. The gameplay elements is very simple, it's basic. You got a whip, you walk through, you slash, you hit, you move on. Get from A to B, beat the enemies, move off screen. Go up some stairs, jump on some chandeliers, go through some caves, go up some waterfalls, find your way to Dracula. But that's the beauty of it, the simplistic element of this game is what I love about it. The later games in the series, they get a bit more complex affectionately known as metroidvanias as you backtrack and you do all types of things you got hit points and all this extra elements towards the castlevania series but to me at the heart of it it's just a hack and slash and as soon as i played it i knew i was wrong my brother was right yeah the music delivers in this game i couldn't believe it hooked me actually i will say the first level didn't hook me the very first level when i played it i thought this is kind of boring this is kind of lackluster but as it progressed, as you went through the levels, each level got better and better and better and it elevated it man. And I'm here to talk about how much I was missing out on. Super Castlevania 4 was an early release for the Super Nintendo, utilizing the Mode 7 effects in good use. Now when you look at it, it might look a little bit basic and you can see how it works. But if you saw that back at the time, it looks like magic. It's like how do they do this? It looks like it's pushing the Super Nintendo boundaries further than they could ever be pushed because you really don't know how they did it. Until Donkey Kong Country came along and it really blew our minds and then Star Wing and Star Fox, those types of games, but these early effects really did get our minds ticking and working out how they did these types of effects when we didn't know. We didn't. I didn't know how games worked, I didn't know how they were made. 
or I could see what I was seeing on screen. And this to me looked like magic to me. Playing this game now, those effects, those simple basic effects, they still hold up. They still get me immersed. People do complain about the end boss in this game for whatever reason. I like it. It's not too hard, it's not too easy. It's right there in the middle, I think. I did hear before I play it how good the soundtrack was, and I thought, okay, yeah, sure, I'm sure it's great. No, it actually is excellent. And when you get to the waterfalls and the caves, it really does bring that element that you are searching for. The immersion, the atmosphere, it's right there. I have tried other Castlevania games in the series, but this one is the basic core of the game that I loved that first time I played it. But you know what, I'm glad I found it eventually. It's a great game to play. If you haven't played it, don't listen to my 11 year old self, listen to me now. How I progressed through the years and got to the best point in my life when it comes to games and knowing what's a great game to play. And this is a great game to play for the Super Nintendo. If you haven't played it before, give it a go. At least once. Like I did. And thanks to Todd again for another excellent suggestion. And now let's get back to the action. The game's overall mechanics are pretty straightforward, with blasting and light platform elements keeping the action going forward. But the big difference is once a certain bosses are defeated, you acquire a beast ability, which transforms you altered beast style to a new form. These demon abilities give you a new regular fire and a charge shot. Each is unique to the next beast's form. Once you transform though, you are now that beast until the next major boss is destroyed. The game definitely has that treasure style to it, meaning there are boss encounters around every corner and it almost feels like the platform segments are simple transitions to the next big smackdown, which is totally cool in my case, as there's nothing worse than long drawn out levels. Having said that though, the game is not the largest, with 7 levels in total that move along at a really brisk pace. The visual design on each stage is really impressive and completely different from the last, making the stages feel very fresh and the bosses are not all that difficult. Simple patterns to avoid and master whatever beasts dodge ability and charge shots and you'll be taking them down pretty easily. The music is also quite good. It's no Castlevania by any means but there's a lot of really good toe tappers that suit the gameplay pretty well. The version shown here is the English fan translation which is pretty good but if you play the Japanese original you won't be missing much as there's only really cutscenes at the beginning and end of the game. So check it out, it's a solid action platformer with a lot of charm. And I hope you enjoy the look at those two awesome games. Thanks for joining me, Bassish B, and Todd the Top Loader for another episode of 16-Bit Days. If you can please like and subscribe to both of us, they'll be greatly appreciated and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Hi and welcome to another episode of 16-Bit Days. This one is going to be a little bit different. We're going to be having a look at two different console versions or sequels to a popular flight simulation series from the 1980s. But before we start checking those out, let's go back to the 80s and check out the original. F-15 Strike Eagle was released by Micropost in 1985 and was designed by Simulation King himself, Sid Meier. The game is based on a real life F-15 Eagle that took its first flight in 1972. It went into military service in every single mission presented in this game, all seven including locations such as Libya, Hanoi and the Persian Gulf and many many more. Strike Eagle is still one of Micropost's very early flight simulators though, so it's not quite as refined or as complicated as future entries. But what it does do, it does quite well. The game doesn't waste any time either and it throws you straight into missions immediately, no takeoffs, just straight to the action. Choose from a mission and the difficulty level with also an interesting arcade mode which takes most of the flight simulation aspects out and turns the game into a first person afterburner. You have all the usual assortment of machine guns, guided missiles and ground based bombs to switch to as you take out enemy SAM installations and aircraft. The graphics are all done in vector style 
as was the standard in a lot of flight simulators in the 80s. The game as per MicroPro standards comes packed with an absolutely dense manual with tons of background information and all the keyboard functions needed. You'll need to check those out if you want any hope of surviving. Make sure you learn those countermeasures as well or else your flying days will be very short lived. It's a bit simplistic overall for a MicroPro's game but it's fairly easy and quick to get into so it's a lot more user friendly in a sense and definitely worth playing if you like your sims a bit more dialed back with a lot more action. And now that we know a little bit about the original, let's jump back to one of the first console 16-bit releases. In mid-93, the Mega Drive and Genesis got F-15 Strike Eagle 2 from Macropros, kings of the flight sim style at that time. Their back catalogue of this genre is one of the best any company has ever released. Strike Eagle 2 is the sequel to the 1985 original and the sequel was released on DOS in 1989. But this Mega Drive version is based on the updated and enhanced 1991 Amiga version. This version goes for the old style full on simulation style gameplay with main cockpit view and multiple selectable outside views. You get to take on many missions in the usual dodgy theatre of operation that these games take place in such as Libya, Vietnam, the Persian Gulf, etc, etc. There are obviously main objectives and side missions as well to take out for bonuses. You have to deal with not only air-based attacks in the form of MiGs and other fighters, but also land-based artillery fire, warships and enemy bases. Navigation is pretty simple with an arrow for your main objective which is selected and a nifty map to jump back and forth to. With the Mega Drive controller having obviously less buttons than a standard keyboard, things have been dialed back slightly to give it a bit more of an arcadey vibe even though it still feels overall very simulation in style. There are nifty options like a time warp feature which speeds up travel from one location to the other and multiple difficulty settings determining whether you have to actually land or take off your plane amongst many other factors. The graphics overall are pretty good with both internal and outside views and some really satisfying explosions with some good music from Matt Furness who did many excellent Commodore 64 tunes before moving into 16-bit with some great stuff like the Alien 3 and the Terminator soundtracks. The missions are satisfying and big with plenty to do, but this game is definitely not going to be for everybody. Even though the action has been amped up a notch, it's still a slow paced game, much like the PC or Amiga counterparts, and rewards the long play, which I really like. Overall, it's a pretty good conversion and a great continuation of the 80s original. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. And now we're going to have a look at the other 16-bit version, a lot different from this one. In 1993, Micropost also delivered Super Strike Eagle on the Super Nintendo, giving two completely different console versions of a follow-up to the original. The Mega Drive version being more in line with the Amiga and way more simulation and style. This Super Nintendo version, however, is much more Top Gun in nature and dialing back the sim aspect dramatically. You fly your F-15 for the United Nations in this game and get sent on strike missions across the world against nations such as North Korea, Iraq, Libya, etc, etc. Each mission in their respective countries you complete means they end up joining the United Nations as seen by their flag getting added to the UN headquarters. Missions are long and have many objectives, but play out in a really fast paced nature with four different views on display with an overworld map style view making it easy to see targets and manipulate your plane in real time. The first person view is switched to when encountering other planes as the dogfights ensue and the overhead bombing view where you take out ground or sea targets by either 
shooting or bombing them head on, with full mode 7 effects bringing these sequences to life, plus brief takeoff and landing third person views. Missions are big as mentioned earlier, but there are friendly bases that you can land at to get refueled, rearmed, as well as repaired, which gives the game an added dose of strategy to be aware of while blasting everything else, plus defenses such as chaff for incoming missiles. The missions also vary with both day and night ones, which gives the game a bit of a visual difference and some much needed variety. I really like the graphics, they are simple but work well, the mode 7 bombing run sequences are impressive, and the excellent use of sound effects and speech samples to enhance the experience, with music only being relegated to the menus and not in game which works well for this style of game. Overall it's an excellent completely different take for this series, and a game that barely gets any mention in the Super Nintendo realms with the constant Mario this and Mario that, this is a welcome breath of fresh air, and a very fun arcade style version of this simulation series. And that's it, I hope you enjoyed these console looks at a classic flight sim series. I'm Bastish B for 64K, I hope you had a good time, and if you can please like and subscribe, that'll be greatly appreciated, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.